Uh, the European Union has now moved one step closer to uh, banning combustion vehicles from 2035. Apparently, there's still one more step to this. The EU is a large and lumbering bureaucracy, so it's not quite yet uh, a done deal. But um, as I mentioned off the top of the show, same thing for New Jersey. New Jersey has done this as well. They've uh, actually got, this is a story from Electrek. Uh, New Jersey requiring all electric car sales by 2035, and they've got many other um, initiatives going on. They want 100% clean electrici uh, electricity. Uh, they've bumped that up to 2035 as well. Um, so, you know, lots of various initiatives in New Jersey. They're, they're doing quite a lot. Yeah, I, you know, I was reading about um, India, and I this was kind of sort of um, left behind, I think, by us. But at COP26, which just happened in the fall, uh, India did commit to 2070, which is not great. It's not what we want, but yeah. at least it's a commitment. But their 2030 targets were interesting. So they, they want a fairly high percentage of electrification in their vehicles and like 80% of their motorcycles, their two-wheel vehicles. So, you know, we could see things in the next few years, the air cleanup uh, in India. I mean, it'll take a while, but, you know, it'll take a while to turn everything over. But it's very interesting how fast these things can happen. And, yeah, like all these places, they take forever. To, they, the, you hear the announcement and then it's, it's a long time before it's really official. And um, there was a story this week. So, you know, the Tesla prices have come down in the U.S. And so now on the leasing prices, the Tesla Model 3 is now like a few bucks cheaper than a Toyota Camry, which is often the car that it's uh, compared to price-wise. So, um, you know, we're getting to that price parity for uh, electric vehicles versus gas vehicles, which is very interesting. Yeah, and I should point out that those Camrys that they compare are usually not the base ones. They're usually... You're trying to compare apples to apples, yeah. so Teslas are really well-loaded cars. They have virtually everything you can imagine. I don't know if you're wanting for anything in your car, but um, if you are, they probably have it in the new cars. So, yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, I I don't know why anyone who could afford a Camry would not buy a Tesla. It. I mean, I think there would be the case of people who just don't know, don't know enough about it, and would go and buy a Camry, but. You know, anybody listening to the show, I think, knows that it'd be a terrible idea to buy a Camry in, instead of that uh, Model 3. Yeah, but, you know, the, the things that are moving really fast now are fleets because you can't fool around when you're a fleet. Yeah. You are, you have a, a budget, you have an accountant, and it makes a huge difference. I mean, it, it makes a difference in, in my life and your life, yeah. but uh, you, have to, you have to figure that out. You have to get a napkin. And I advise anyone who's thinking about it to... Know what your local, I didn't know what my local electricity price was. I never paid attention to what price per kilowatt hour it was. I mean, I just knew what my local, my bill was every month. That's the only thing I really paid attention to. But yeah, I mean, typically it's around 14 cents a kilowatt hour and it can be a lot more in some places mm -hmm. and even less in others. And sometimes there's, uh, you know, uh, peak demand pricing where it's cheaper to do it uh, overnight. So it becomes even a fraction of your normal price and you can charge a car overnight. So if you write down how many miles, kilometers you you ride every year, and if they're highway or, or city, and you can figure this out. And it's uh, you, can, you can do the napkin calculations and fairly quickly realize that it's not just the cost of the car, it's the cost of ownership. I mean, we, we pay 120 bucks for an oil change every eight, 10 months. So, yeah. I mean, that's that's gone. Yay. I hate oil changes. I won't miss those, Brian. <laughs> My God. Oh, and speaking of such things, we have an, uh, a letter here from, uh, who's it from? It's from Bryce. So, let's talk to Bryce. Bryce, Brian, I'm afraid Bryce is in Florida, and I made fun of Florida last week or the uh -oh. week before. What I did is I made fun of Florida and laughed and said, we don't have any listeners in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> typical. Yeah. Typical. I'm never saying that again. I'm never making the assumption that we have no listeners somewhere. Uh, number one you know, news podcast in Macedonia, news commentary. So just check that out in Macedonia. Whoever you are, I wish those people would write us a letter too. But it says, hello, Brian and James. I want to start this email by saying that I am a fan of the show and the work that both of you have done. My name is Bryce Hauser. I'm from, I'm a master's student at the University of Florida studying international business and environmental science. 
I'm looking to work in the business side of renewable energy upon my graduation in May. And I'm reaching out for your help. Renewable energy is no doubt the solution to climate change and the global warming crisis. Uh, however, I recently started to learn more about the cobalt mining in the Congo, um, the absurdly harmful and awful human and environmental impacts that are taking place there. Uh, due to the bulk of cobalt, bolt, <laughs> that's, that's something my mouth can't say. Due to the bulk of cobalt mined going uh, to renewable energy such as EVs, I've reached a crisis because I pursued this career to help the environment and people. But I can't but feel that I'm a part of this problem. I wanted uh, to ask what is your opinion on the cobalt mining in the Congo, and if you have any information on it or have talked about it in the podcast, please let me know. Thank you for your time. I'm inspired by you both. Thank you so much, Bryce. We appreciate the kind words and the letter. Brian, I've got a few things to say, but I'll let you start off and take a shot at this. Well, I mean, it's a difficult topic. I'm certainly not an expert on cobalt in the Congo, except I think we've all heard about, you know, negative things as far as that. Very negative things. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is, I think often the first thing that comes up, not cobalt specifically, but when I tell people I've got a clean energy podcast or something, they almost always leap to the negatives about it where, um, you know, yeah, like there's still a carbon footprint to electric vehicles. Like, you know, n none of this stuff is a, a perfect solution, but um, it's, you know, a thousand times better than digging up oil and burning it. Like, you know, there's literally thousands of people dying from air pollution every single day. So it'd be difficult to add up the, the negatives about clean energy and, and have them somehow be worse. Okay, so yeah, there are valid concerns about the extraction in the Democratic Republic of Congo in particular. Uh, they produce 60% of the world's supply of cobalt I have here, and cobalt has been used in most lithium-ion batteries for decades and decades. And uh, Forbes has pointed out that no one's throwing away their cell phones. <laughs> but, you know, to be fair, a lot more batteries obviously go into an EV, so... And there's all kinds of hideous things going on in the Congo and all kinds of things where they try to correct it and maybe not. I don't yeah. know. And cobalt is one of the smaller elements in these batteries. But, um, you know, when you make so many of them, it's a problem. Okay. So on the bright side, Bryce, uh, according to Forbes, there is a solid financial reason why EV makers are reducing and eventually hope to eliminate cobalt from their batteries. It's hugely expensive. And one of the main contributors to the comparatively high purchase price of EVs. Now, Brian Tesla has done this with LFP, like uh, lithium phosphate batteries, right? They're not as energy dense, but they're safer and they have no cobalt. Yeah, I wasn't sure if they had no cobalt, but that's that's great. And less nickel, too, I think. Yeah. Uh, let me just read it here. It says, it, ion, sorry, I said lithium phosphate. It's iron phosphate batteries, L LFP. Um, which are quite common now. I think Tesla had half their batteries were LFP last year, so they've got a lot of cobalt out of their... That would include their energy, their grid scale stuff too. So uh, they don't use nickel or cobalt, are traditionally cheaper and safer, but they offer less energy density, which is a problem for EVs. But Bryce, it's not a problem for decarbonizing the grid, right, Brian? Because you don't care about energy density so much when you're putting a giant battery installation on a piece of land. It doesn't matter. You don't care about the weight. You don't care about the volume yeah. as much. And the LFP batteries are just cheaper too. So um, we can deploy right. more of them at a, at a lower cost. And safer. So the idea is that they're going into, um, yeah, less efficiency and shorter range means they're going into the shorter range vehicles, but not the more premium, longer range versions of vehicles will have the different batteries. But hopefully, hopefully... That'll change soon. Lately, they have improved enough that it now makes sense to use cobalt-free batteries in lower-end and shorter-range electric vehicles, according to Electric, and also frees up the production of battery cells with other more energy-dense chemistries to produce longer-range vehicles. Tesla was early in recognizing this, and I remember uh, Elon Musk talking about this, this fact, and, and you know, he started adopting the chemistry for shorter-range fairly quick, first in China, I believe. Yeah, and then the other issue were patents, that there are patents to the LFP batteries, which just recently expired, I think at the beginning of this year, end of last year, or something like that. So uh, that's another thing that's making the LFP batteries uh, cheaper to produce, which which is great. And just as a follow-up here, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo does have 60% of the world's uh, 
cobalt production, but they're not everyone, right? Russia, unfortunately, is second. <laughs> uh, second place, yeah. They're not using children, I don't think, in their minds. Who knows? But they are using the money from that for nefarious reasons, I'm sure. Australia, though, is number three. Um, but it is a fraction of what the Congo does. And Philippines and Canada is actually, let's see here, uh, second, third, fourth, fifth. But we're 25th of the Congo. The thing is, though, everyone's aware of the, the, the Congo problem. And they're, they're trying to exert pressure to fix it. Or they're not going to, you know, Congo's not going to sell any cobalt. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be that. At least to a lot of people, they're going to sell a lot less of it. So they're expanding... Um, as much Congo, pr I mean, sorry, they're expanding as much uh, cobalt production as possible everywhere else. Yeah. They're, you know, the <laughs> the pedals to the metal, and they're doing it as fast as they can. Cuba also has some in Papua New Guinea, um, but like I said, they're all fractions of what the Congo has. But altogether, yeah. there's forty percent, and hopefully that keeps going up. And if you have it for sale, and you're not the Congo, and you're not Russia, people will want to buy it. Yes, and then you, they'll be the first people to sell it, and so there's a big incentive to invest. Investment is a big deal here, Brian. Yeah, so I don't know. I think it's important just not to get despondent about it because, of course, you know, the clean energy transition is not perfect. There's certainly downsides to it, but, you know, the biggest downside is digging up oil and burning it. Like, we obviously yeah. have to stop doing that. And, you know, you'll hear all kinds of negative things, but a lot of these things are whipped up by the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, cobalt in, uh, in Congo is, is ethical. It's not. Yeah. But, um, you know, the fossil fuel industry is constantly reminding people of a lot of things that aren't factual. And, you know, it's not just coming from Congo. Yeah, and they, of it they've, was. they've got lots of people kind of spreading their um, information for them. Um, because like I say, it's it's the first thing, not necessarily the Congo, but people always bring up the negative aspects when they, you know, start talking to me about clean energy. So it's, it's more likely that it's going to be in your cell phone battery in a few years than in your EV. Because the cell phone needs energy density, the EV is bigger, and they they'll be able to charge faster and uh, have smaller batteries than the extended range versions of the vehicles now. So, yeah, I'm pretty optimistic about it, although this is definitely a growing pain and it's very frustrating. But I would not be discouraged because it's not the future, it's the present. Yeah. And things are going to get better and 50% um, of batteries right now are now cobalt free and that's only going to get better. Everything's going to get better every day. So I applaud you for what you've done with your career and your caring about people. We are the same way and we uh, encourage you to have uh, a successful run in your life and let us know, keep us up to date on uh, the very interesting things that I'm sure you're going to do and encounter in your life. Yeah, thanks Bryce. Uh, okay, so we've been talking regularly about the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States of America, and it's um, lots of money and subsidies for various aspects of the clean energy revolution, and EV chargers is a big one. There is billions of dollars going in the U.S. from government money to um, improve the charging network and put in more chargers. But another favorite topic of ours is how, you know, often these chargers do not work. Um, you know, you often talk about the out of spec motoring channel on YouTube and he started a new, um, Twitter account called rate your charge. And, you know, there's other people doing sort of similar things, but I have been following that on Twitter lately. And the idea is that you just, you know, you're charging your electric vehicle somewhere and you make a little post and you tag rate your charge and, and, and tell us about the charging. And it is fairly discouraging. It's exactly the kind of thing that, that we're talking about. Somebody will be at a charger in Mississippi and they'll say, okay, one charger is working. The other three are broken. Um, or I'm on this 350 kilowatt charger, but it's only giving me 50 kilowatts. You know, it's very, unfortunately, long list of problems. Uh, Tesla being the exception, they have excellent reliability and the, the Tesla network works well. Um, they will be opening that up eventually in the U.S. to non-Tesla vehicles. That's still in the works. That's that's going to take a while. Uh, but anyway, so they're going to add a requirement in the U.S. that you need a 97% uptime reliability on your chargers if you are getting this government subsidy. 
Now, it's not quite clear how they're going to police this or how they're going to figure out um, if, you know, people are sticking to that. But um, I think it's a start and it's a very necessary one because this is obviously a huge problem and you don't want to be uh, spending billions of dollars on chargers that don't work. Like that's going to just seem like the biggest boondoggle of all time if this is what happens and all, you know, all these thousands of chargers get deployed. Well, and... I, I tell you, if you have a charging network that works, so your Tesla and you do widely open it and it does work, you, your first choice is to navigate a trip on the highway to a Tesla charger. So these other guys, these other competitors who are making these crappy chargers and not fixing them yeah. are screwed, including yeah. the oil companies who are trying to get into this. And it seems to be because, you know, Tesla's always seen the business case for this, but it always seems like everyone else has treated it like it's a charity case. It's like, oh, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll do some electric chargers. They're not really thinking long term that, you know, eventually these are going to replace all the gas pumps. So... Um, they should, you know, start thinking about it more from a business standpoint. In fact, I'm going to find another um, article here. Just give me a second. Um, oh, yeah, this is from Green Tech Lead. Uh, EV charging revenue to exceed $300 billion by 2027. So right now, they're expecting it to be $66 billion in 2023. And by 2027, up to $300 billion. So there's there's money to be made here. Um and especially with these generous subsidies. You know what I'm waiting for is Tesla to put more solar with their chargers because they promised they would do that years ago. Yeah. Uh, in order, if nothing else, to bring the price down. Yeah. Uh, for them and for everyone else. So yeah. uh, what's taking so long? Solar and like also possibly with the like uh, mega chargers they're going to be deploying with semi trucks. Those are going to have an even faster charging rate. So it sounds like they're probably going to put like a Tesla mega pack of batteries with those charging stations. So the ideal is that every charging station has some solar and has some battery storage as a buffer to, you know, fill up the batteries when the costs are low and the sun is shining and to be able to provide the highest amount of uh, electricity because some places on the grid aren't necessarily going to have enough juice to, you know, uh, be charging up, you know, thousands and thousands of watts uh, at a time. So a month or two ago, we had a story about a appliance maker that was putting a battery into an induction cooktop stove. Right. I don't know if you remember that. And the reason was, or was it just the induction cooktop? It was the reason was because people didn't have enough power generally to use these devices. So this yeah. charged up and gave you the surge for the time it needed. Yeah, no, it's if, yeah, a lot of people, they don't have enough space on their electrical panels. You know, I, I doubled the space on mine, 100 amps to 200 amps. But yeah, things like that could really help where, um, you know, you've got a plug-in that only can supply 15 amps. But if your unit has a battery in it, then you could maybe for short periods of time go up higher than that. Yeah, That'd it's one amazing. of the struggles as we get into higher rates is the connection to the grid becomes more expensive if you have a bunch of people charging at, you know, 350 kilowatts compared to the really yeah. first ones, the 50 kilowatt ones that's, that the Bolt charges at in, in a few old EVs like the Nissan Leaf. So, yeah. That's one way to do it, and and Tesla's set up to do that because they have the mega packs ready to go. They make them themselves. So if you charge those suckers up with solar, uh, you know, I would like to see them at least canopies as a as a token amount of electricity over the uh, over the cars. Yeah. And it's nice to have a covering too. You know, yeah. most gas stations have a covering over the pumps. It'd be great to have that for all EVs. Because you're sitting there in the hot sun or the rain or whatever, and. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice, especially if you have one of my vending machines that you can go to that I've I envision for future <laughs> for future EV charging stations with fresh sandwiches made by robots. Brian, see, I'm, I'm <laughs> developing this. You know, robots are getting into food preparation. This is the perfect situation. It's a isolated highway charging station. You know, what do you want in your sub sandwich, Mister Whittingham? Oh, I'll make anything. It's the sandwich artist of the future. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Um, the Saskatchewan Electric Vehicle Association has posted um, sort of a survey that our utility did here where Brian and I live on uh, EV drivers. So I thought I would touch on that because some of them were a little surprising. And they may be more surprising to you than to me because I've been talking to a lot of people about this. Overall, driver satisfaction with EVs averaged 9.3 out of 10. 
And I bet at least 0.4 of that negative rating is from somebody who doesn't own an EV but did the survey and then they'll ask because they're a hater. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the top three motivations for purchasing or leasing an EV. Number one, can you guess what it was, audience? Brian, tell us. I'll leave a gap because I can see it right here in front of me. Okay. I'm not. I'm letting the audience guess because I know you know the answer. <laughs> it's saving money, right? Yeah. What do you think about that one, Brian? Yeah, that is surprising. I mean, I, I didn't think I was going to save money with my EV because really? I knew I was getting in a bit early. Um, I, I thought I might, after 10 years, kind of be comparable to a, a gas vehicle, but... Well, when I bought my used Leaf for 10 grand, uh, five years old... Different story. I knew it would pay for itself in five years compared to... Yeah. Well, I was using a gas guzzler SUV with premium gas, but it all made it very easy, so... Saving money was essential to my purchase because I didn't have a lot of money for fooling around. Um, but I would say my interest in the technology was number one. That's probably what I wrote on the survey. Um, saving money too. And, you know, I, I want to save the environment, but I'm also not stupid. I know that, you know, if I wanted to save the environment, this isn't the best way to do it. I would take a bus or a, a bike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it is better than than buying again. It's better for the environment. And there's all kinds of studies that are out there. Yeah. So number one was saving money. Number two, the environment. Number three, interest in new technology. And that might surprise some people. Um, here's what people are using them for. Business use was 3% and personal use was 97. I expect that to change greatly yeah. over the next yeah. couple of years, not even that long. No, and as we know, most business vehicles drive for longer periods of time, so um, it won't take long for that to flip. That's starting to flip now. 5% uh, lease and 95% own. Uh, only 12% were used. I'd be one of those people. And yeah, the rest were new because it's hard where we live to buy a used vehicle. Oh, yeah, very hard. Not so hard in TV. California, Colorado, Oregon, places like that. Uh, place, some places in Europe, certainly Germany, or certainly um, Norway, I was going to say. Uh, yeah. Saskatchewan EV drivers' concerns, not enough battery range was 30%, not enough local charging stations, 34%, not enough highway charging stations, that's the one that they're concerned about, 85%, and for good reason. Performance during winter, 36%. So the majority of people, though, are not concerned about range. They're not concerned about having local charging stations, and they're not concerned about winter performance, which everyone hopefully knows goes down. Yeah, It's just a matter of um, education and a whole different paradigm that you have to get used to. So the average public charging station uses per year were 13. Um, so 13 public charges and, yeah... Out of province, eight. So those those are people who are going on trips. So, you know, if you think of all the times that you charge your car, I charge mine every day. Some people don't have yeah. to. Uh, they charge, uh, you know, once a week or twice a week. You know, all those charges, most of them are at home and are not of concern. And once they iron out the highway charging, um, which Biden's trying to do here, as you mentioned earlier, hopefully it will work out. For, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's not as much... There's more of a concern of breaking broken stations rather than having the stations because there's almost yeah. enough stations to get by right now if they were working. Yeah, and as these statistics point out, you don't really need as many charging stations as you need gas stations probably because you do most of your charging at home, whereas you can't fill up your gasoline car. And home. as I've predicted before in the show, I predict... Gas stations will go away in the cities. They'll be harder to find because every yeah. everyone on the highway is where you're going to be charging your vehicle. And, you know, condo owners and business owners and shopping malls and uh, grocery stores, they're all going to come around soon enough, at least in the next rest of this decade, if not in the next two to three years, depending on where you live. Yeah, so I, I'm pretty optimistic about that. Um, remember, we are kind of out in the boonies here. We're not... Um, we're kind of the latest adopters of uh, this technology, so that's where we're at. Yeah, and the the Tesla charging network opening up to non-Teslas, that is a huge thing. It's happened a little bit in Europe. It's happened a bit in Australia, coming soon to the USA. There's been no mention of us here in Canada. I'm thinking a, a couple of years from now, it'll be opened up. 
And so, you know, I think in, say, about two years, the health thing, uh, the uh, charging situation will be uh, very, very healthy. You know, our show, being three years old, we've talked in the early days of our show about flying taxis, and now you have something yeah. to say about that. Yeah, so the first electric air taxi takes flight around New York City. This is from Electrek. So this is a company called Blade Air Mobility and Beta Technologies in a partnership. Uh, they have now tested their first electric vertical takeoff and landing air taxi in the New York City area. So... Um, you know, th this is the flying cars that we were promised, uh, you know, by the Jetsons. Yeah. Uh, back back when we were kids. It's finally <laughs> happening. Basically, flying cars. Where do I buy mine, Brian? And uh, who do I buzz first? Yeah. And, you know, makes sense in a place like Manhattan. I'm assuming that they're going to use, you know, like a really dense place like that. Uh, you know, if you're a, a billionaire and you need to get somewhere quickly. I want to be one know, of those guys, you know, the, you have my own building to take off from the roof. The yeah, you don't want to schlep around in a taxi. Or, no, I don't want to go uh, down to the ground. No, like you can, you know, take off from LaGuardia and land on the roof of your private building. Sure, and I want McDonald's to have a skyscraper that I can stop on and go through the drive through up there, you know. Make it nice oh, air, air drive throughs I hadn't thought of that. Invented here on the Clean Energy <laughs> Show. Cha-ching. <laughs> so um, these are obviously kind of small. It uh, doesn't say the exact number of passengers, but they're making one that's optimized for passengers, one that's made for cargo. Uh, 250 nautical miles range. Do you know what that is in normal miles? Nautical miles. You know, I've, I, I looked it up and it didn't stick. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit be different. It's, it's a, they're almost the same. Yeah. They're almost so the same. Yeah, it's two hundred fifty nautical miles, maybe a few more of that in regular. But miles. speed and in knots is very different. Yeah, uh, it takes fifty minutes to to charge up. So um, yeah, I would love to take a ride in one of those. I want to be the first person. I'd be the ten thousandth or so, <laughs> maybe twenty millionth. I don't know. Yeah, uh, there was um, a soccer game my kid was watching in the Premier League in England where it was interrupted for six minutes because of a drone, a toy <laughs> drone. Yeah. And yeah, they had to shuffle everybody off the field. And they, I can just imagine some, you know, teenage kid actually up there in the drones trying to watch the game. <laughs> what kind yeah, of shenanigans guess... are going to happen when people get their hands? I mean, the, the big thing is I don't want them driving over my house. Um, yeah. Know, that's what Musk said before. And yeah, the, but they, they have some uses. I mean, if you're replacing oh, yeah. helicopters in Manhattan, then yeah. giddy up. And, you know. And I imagine they'll be kind of noisy, but not as noisy as a, a gas. No, I've heard the, con the contrast. It's, it's, they aren't, you're right. They're noisy, but not nearly, nearly as noisy. We have air ambulances that fly over my house on a regular basis. Do you have that too? No, I don't see them now. Really? Well, we have them all the time. And I don't know. I think it's because people are stupider up north where they, <laughs> they have to go get the people who drive into trees and, uh, and get them out of their car wrecks more often because it seems like a frequent thing. Anyway, um, listen, the, the New York City Fire Commissioner, Laura Cavanaugh, has called upon the Consumer Product Safety Commission to take action and help prevent what it calls substandard lithium-ion batteries from entering the United States. Now, these are batteries from China that are going into cheap e-bikes, which are, you know, e-bikes are expensive, but you can get substantially cheaper ones from China, and the batteries are part of the reason. So Kavanaugh made the appeal to the Public Safety Office after NYC experienced hundreds of e-bike and e-scooter Battery fires, hundreds, Brian, this is not good. Six yeah. of which resulted in fatalities last year. So in a statement, Kavanaugh advocated further measures to block the import of low quality batteries and ban so-called universal battery chargers, which I've seen and thought about it. Now I'm not because I thought, well, what happens if my charger breaks? You have to have really the right charger. Really specific, yeah. The right amps, the right wattage, the you know, the right volts. Everything has to be right or, and you can't just leave it charging most of the time either. You have to unplug it, as you've We've learned. talked about that. They often don't have great battery management on them. So, you know, plug them in for an hour, set a timer, an hour and a half, set a timer, make sure you unplug it. Yeah. And, and it doesn't guarantee a fire, but I mean, if you left it on for days, maybe it, it could or who knows, but you definitely want, there's so many things that I have now, like I've got batteries for drills. I've got a battery for my snowblower. Yeah. I've got a... 
you know, there seems to be all kinds of things around the house. The e-bike battery is the biggest one. No, we talked about it when I went to Banff and we recorded a podcast when I was in Banff and it was like an insane array of devices that need charging that I uh, that I had to take with me, including yeah. my car because I drove there electrically. Yeah, it's not good. I mean, there was a cargo plane that had to crash land. No, it landed quickly because there was a, a you know battery fire. So they considered that on planes hazardous materials if they're in the cargo hold. Um, so New York City officials uh, take the threat posed by low-quality e-bike batteries seriously, they said, in one in incident. This is the worst-case scenario, the biggest fear. In 2022, even led to firefighters having to use ropes hanging from the 20th floor of a building to save people trapped by a blaze. So that's a nightmare. And, you know, as this expands around the world and e-mobility becomes e bigger and bigger, we do have to address this problem. So be careful with what you buy and how well, you I have it. two e-bikes parked in a closet not far away from me, so um, let's hope they don't catch on fire. Can you take the batteries off? No, you can't. The batteries are built in, so no. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to think we should have little halon counters with metal to, uh, you know, like the halon dump to kill battery fires or extinguish the oxygen in the air. Right. And have, you know, maybe have like, well, I've got a battery for my, um, like a, a deep cycle 12 volt battery for my RV. So, you know, we have, I keep warning people around the house, you know, don't put anything by that. We don't want to burn down the house. No, and, and uh, uh, electric vehicles, as we often mention, they do catch on fire sometimes. The batteries do catch on fire sometimes, but it's still at a rate much less than gasoline cars. Uh, Ford had some problems recently. They actually had to halt production of the Ford F-150 Lightning uh, electric pickup truck because some of them that were completed and, and waiting for inspection, uh, one of them caught on fire, uh, seemed to be fairly spontaneously, and then the fire spread to a couple other vehicles. So they have halted production. They've said that they think they know what the problem is, and they should be able to resume production soon. They haven't recalled any vehicles or anything. People who um, have the vehicles, they haven't issued any warnings or anything. So uh, hopefully that turns out okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, I just wanted to mention a podcast in case you were interested um, in the wood burning stove issue. We've mentioned it a couple of times on the on the show, and the Guardian has been doing a lot of uh, stories about this. The Guardian in the UK. Um, and uh, I, I'm not going to play a clip or anything because we've sort of talked about this a bit. But in case anyone is interested, uh, The Guardian has a podcast called Today in Focus. And one of the most recent uh, episodes is about a half hour long. And they discuss this issue of wood burning stoves and the particular particulate uh, pollution that they cause and um, how it is definitely a, a pollution issue that we should not uh, forget about. So it's the Today in Focus podcast from The Guardian um, if you're interested in that issue. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts has always been the uh, Under the Influence, the CBC radio advertising and yeah. show, which you can yeah. get anywhere in the world in podcasts. And they were replaying an old episode yesterday where they had the, the, um, the person who runs the show is uh, in advertising and he sent out letters to all of his buddies from his career for strange stories. And the top one was a major... Um, son of a brewing empire in the United States came to Canada to make a commercial. And they watched the commercial and the commercial involved somebody, uh, the father cutting like a Thanksgiving turkey and serving it. And the guy says, well, wouldn't the butler serve that to people? I don't understand. And he just <laughs> could not understand why the father was serving food because he lived in such a bubble of richness. <laughs> well, who feeds the butlers? I don't understand how you would feel so stupid. I just had to bring that up. But anyway, it's time for the Tweet of the Week. This comes from Simon Evans at Carbon Brief. His uh, handle is D-R-S-I-M Evans. And he says, uh, the Solar Outlooks Viz Realities tweeted a chart. We're always talking about how the outlooks for everything you and I talk about are always not what they are. They're always yeah, underestimated. The put out by the sort of major agencies like the international energy agencies, they're always underestimating how much clean energy is going to get deployed. So every year they raise it up the starting point, but it's basically a flat line or it goes up slightly. 
Yeah, and they're not reality, drawing it like an S curve like they should. But this, this is Brian is is getting beyond an S curve. The solar adoption worldwide. Uh, this is from the International Energy Agency. It's going almost straight up. Yeah, it's crazy. So that is S curving the hell out of S S's. That's just nuts. It's going. It's just taking off like freaking crazy, and still all their estimates are well, it'll probably be flat. So. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is no this is the International Age Energy Agency that has predicted these flat outlooks, and they have done this for years and years, even years before we started this podcast. I was looking at this stuff, saying, "You idiots!" So they're always conservative, but you know it's not the reality of it. Yeah, no, the amount of solar being deployed is insane right now. And Simon points out that these forecasts are based on twenty-five year life cycles of solar panel farms. And generally speaking, he's saying they're going to last longer than that. You know, the, yeah. I would keep the panels on my roof for 40 years if I didn't want to replace them. I mean, there's advantages to replacing them because they'll be cheaper in 40 years. They'll be yeah. probably put out twice the power they do now in 40 years. So Yeah. And it's a bit like LED light bulbs. Like at a certain point in their lifespan, they don't put out quite as much light. And they still work, but and solar panels are kind of the same way. They the efficiency eventually drops, and they don't put out what they did when they were new. But, but the it, point they is, they should work. Nobody's going to trash everything in twenty five years. These things could go on. They could just build another solar farm next door yeah. until that one does need replacing. And then, yeah, easier to do that than to 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 trash them. And then you know that makes this even crazier. And it's crazy as it is. So anyway, Brian, I want to dip into the mailbag once again. This is another letter we have this week. I heard your comment on this week's podcast about getting a portable induction stovetop and thought you might be able to use this very technical analysis of the energy needed to boil a liter of water from an electric kettle. The episode also talks about induction stoves at one point. Have a very efficient day from Jeff Fahrenholtz in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, greatly appreciate you sending us a note. This is a YouTuber, Brian, that I've seen before, and you've seen this video, right? Yeah, no, it's it's uh, <laughs> boiling water is one of my favorite topics because <laughs> because I'm a very boring person. Fortunately, you're not looking for a mate because that would not be a good calling <laughs> card. <laughs> yes, but I I want to remind my listeners of like I and he actually mentions this in the YouTube video um that he knows people in the usa who have put in 240 volt outlets in their kitchen yeah. because they want to bo boil that person water. would be crazy to do that because they wanted to boil water fast yes. wouldn't they and that is exactly what i did i ordered a kettle from the uk the uk kettles the uk electrical system all their kettles are like 3000 watts and they run on you know 220 or 240 volts so i ordered a kettle from the uk i switched had the an plug. electrician install it I had an electrician install a 240 volt plug in the kitchen and then um, had them change the plug because you need a North American uh, two, 220 volt plug rather than the UK one. And uh, so, yeah, so I have that. So this is one of my favorite topics. So thank you, Jeff, for bringing it up so I could talk about my amazing 240 volt kettle in my kitchen that boils <laughs> Any water. Any chance he gets, people ask him yeah. about his damn kettle. Super, <laughs> super, it's like literally like we, you know, we upgraded our whole kitchen and it's literally the best thing about it. Okay. Okay, Brian. You went to the UK, you, you saw how fast their water boiled, you were envious, I, you yeah. took action. At first I was confused. I Like, you know, we rented this condo <laughs> Is water the different UK, here? <laughs> and it was boiling so quickly. I was like, well, what's going on here? And then, you know, just flipped it over and it said 3000 watts, which is unheard of around here. Well, it makes it good for car charging too. Um, you don't have to do weird things that we have to in North America. It's true. Yeah. Their sort of base power load for the, the UK is way better than ours. So this YouTuber um, did a one liter of water boiling test with different things. Because right now there's a big discussion about how gas stoves are the fast way to cook. Well, gas was the slowest, okay? Gas took yeah. eight minutes. No, there's there's basically propaganda being spread by the gas industry to make you think that gas is somehow the best thing to cook with, and it is totally not. Whenever there's propaganda spread, Brian, I find that the opposite is often true. You know, yeah. it's, they don't fool around. They go not just a little blaze with the line. They go to the, they try to flip everything around. Well, it, the gas flame actually took the longest. Now, this is with a gas stove top with a kettle that you sit right on the stove top. Now, one thing I also learned is that people in the United States don't drink tea. 
No, and they they don't often even have electric kettles. Like an electric kettle is a very common thing in Canada, absolutely ubiquitous in the UK. But uh, no, electric kettles are not much of a thing even now in the in the USA. So. We do boil water, though. I mean, I boil it for pasta. I boil it for other food items. And um, some family members may make some sort of porridge. You know, we boil corn on the cob. There's different things you boil for, yeah, water for. Yeah, and if we are making pasta, and we still have a gas cooktop, which I'm trying to get rid of. But, um, yeah, we boil the water in the kettle and then pour it into the pot on the stove Your because it's way kettle. faster. Yeah. And that's what he says, that it's faster to do. So what he did is he went out and bought... Uh, an electric kettle on uh, Walmart, and it's the cheapest one you could buy. It was like 14 bucks, And it had a little heating element, not on the bottom, not a plate on the bottom like most of ours do in our yeah. house, but an actual sort of loop of a thing that gets red hot in the middle of the water, and that's the most yeah. efficient. So even though it's only a 1,500-watt kettle because the heating element is immersed in the water, it ends up boiling faster than the gas and even faster than... Like um, just, a, you know, a regular electric stove. So currently in our house, we have a, a glass cooktop. So it's a smooth cooktop and little circles get red underneath, right? That's yeah. kind of the easy cleanup version of uh, what, where we progressed after the coil ones. And that took six minutes. So the first one, uh, the gas was eight. So even mine is two minutes faster or 25% faster than the, the gas flame. And the kettle that you plugged in was actually the most efficient, pretty much. At even at 110, it was four minutes and 33 seconds, practically twice as fast as gas, you yeah. know. So that was significantly faster. But then, you know, to my interest, he also looked into portable and regular induction uh, cooktops because that's what I was talking about last week. Thanks to induction technology, the stovetop kettle can be even faster than an electric kettle. In fact potentially faster than a European one. Induction stoves are the new hotness, and they work by sending high-frequency alternating current through a coil of wire beneath the cooking surface. When a suitable cooking vessel is placed above it, electric currents are induced within the vessel's metal base. Those currents will actually heat the bottom of the pot, or what have you, just like the current flowing through a heating element. In effect, it turns the pot itself into the heating element. At full power, this brought a liter of water to boil in 4 minutes and 29 seconds. That's the fastest result we've seen. Hardwired induction cooktops you'll find either on their own or attached to an oven often feature a burner that can pump out close to 4 kilowatts, sometimes more. With one of those, you could boil a liter of water in 90 seconds flat. Wow. I would like to, if you get that induction cooktop, and I know you will, yeah. I want to I want to do a test between your uh, British kettle yeah. and the induction with one liter of water. Yeah, so I have ordered an induction cooktop to replace the gas one. It's a full-sized unit, be built in, so I'll have to get an electrician to install it. And uh, yeah, I think it actually will be faster because it, it um, I think it'll be faster, but we, yeah, we'll have to see. Oh, we have to do the science, Brian. Science yeah. excites me. <laughs> and we'll have the exclusive right here on the show. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's so cool. I, um, I'm still thinking about getting an, an induction portable just for boiling water. And, yeah. Because they're so cheap, you know, like. Um, no, yeah. and, and even if you're just getting a normal like that, you know, $15 electric kettle to all of our American listeners who are missing out on the beauty of an electric kettle. Uh, think about it. They're great. Well, they, you could make hot chocolate with it. You know, I am instant coffee. <laughs> I make pour over coffee with it. So, um, you know, you just grind coffee, you put it in a cone, you just pour, you boil the water in the kettle, pour it over the, the grounds. It's a great way to make coffee. French press or pour over? No, pour over. You used to be a French press man. What happened? I still have one. Use it very occasionally, but I like the pour over. Okay. I have one for camping off the grid worked really well the one time I use it, but I prefer, I prefer the grid, Brian. <laughs> the grid's and so shout nice. out to the French Press Cafe where I go for coffee in the neighborhood sometimes. Ah, free coffee for Brian. <laughs> yeah. Well, I look forward to uh, our next letter. Thank you for writing us, uh, Jeff, in Ohio. And we've had uh, 
you know, it's really interesting to hear what people are thinking about and what they, what they bring to the show. And I know you guys probably have lots of questions. Don't be afraid to contact us here at the show. We'd love to hear anything. There's no such thing as stupid questions um, because other people have the same questions. So contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com or your views or concerns on anything that you might have. It is now time, Brian, for the prestigious Lightning Round. Yeah, it's a short one this week. It's a holiday here where we live yesterday, so I've had less time than normal. But here we go. Overlook story in addition. Um... EVs, this is the uh, the story about India. Okay, I want to be specific about this because I didn't have the numbers in front of me at the time. I do now. Uh, EV sales penetration by 2030 of 30% private vehicles. 70%, though, of commercial vehicles in India will have to be uh, EVs by 2030, which is, you know, that's kind of, yep. in a way, matching or better than some of our North American and European targets. 40% of buses will have to be electric by then. And 80% two- and three-wheelers by 2030. And I think um, I think by 2030 that it's going to be better than that for buses and things because things will be cheaper. And two-wheelers, everyone will be envious of anyone who has a two-wheeler that doesn't need a tune-up or a spark plug or a carburetor cleaning and stinks yep. and loud and it's quiet and doesn't have the same torque. The U.S. will allocate $7 billion to residential solar projects in disadvantaged communities. That is not a small number, Brian. That is a big, fat number. Uh, another $20 billion will be invested in new clean energy uh, nationwide. So this is another announcement from the White House. And, yeah, I think this is a great idea to help. You know, it's it's been talked about. There's been some pilot projects here and there. But, you know, why not give cheap electricity to the people who need it most? and help the environment and uh, invest in jobs while you're doing it. BP to invest $1 billion in EV charging across the United States by 2030. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I imagine they're going to get some of those sweet, sweet subsidies that uh, are yeah. being handed out. Um, so I, I guess it's better they do that than make another offshore oil rig. Let's just, they're going to have to work, though. 90% uptime. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for a CES Fast Fact. Rideshare rides consume 67% more energy than the rides that they replace. So you might think ride sharing, good idea. Yeah. Uh, not the, generally speaking, though, not the case until electrification happens. Yeah. So this is prior to electrification. Prior to electrification and generally the fleet as a whole right now. So, yeah, it's going to have to change uh, because those cars are driving around and not doing anything. So you know, for part of that time. So you have to factor that into the rise they do. By the way, um, you know our Autospec review guy? Uh, the Autospec review guy took a ride in a Waymo. I found it kind of interesting because, you know, he's a surrogate for you and I or anyone else who might be doing it, and he made a whole half-hour video of it. And you get in, and you just call it on your app, and the thing shows up by itself. He was in Phoenix. And the thing, you know, you're waiting for this vehicle to show up for you, this robot. It's kind of odd. And it shows up at the, I don't know where they were, a Walmart parking lot or something. And they were going to go to Target a half hour away. And it shows up, and they get in, and it, has, it says CK for Kyle Connor, on the, or whatever his name is, on the front. And, uh, you know, you know who it is. It's in big LED letters. And he gets in, and it, and it starts driving. And starts talking to you and giving you information, like a human voice. And the wheel, there's plastic to prevent you from touching the steering wheel. So it says, don't touch the steering wheel. It drives itself under any circumstance. There's a stop button. If, you don't, if you're not happy, press the stop button or press the pullover button or another panic button where you can contact. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, he said there's, they were kind of notorious for phantom braking. And he said there was some of that. But generally speaking, and it scared the life out of him when it made a left turn. Like it, it just, you know, but it drove like a normal person, but you don't know what's going to happen, right? Uh, so I imagine yeah. it's going to be very tense for a lot of people their first rides, but it works. I mean, it's, 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 they're doing it and, you know, it's pre-mapped and they've got LIDAR galore on the roof, things, 
It looks like a, a warship with all the things spinning around on top. But yeah, no, I mean, they work and they're the future. They're coming. So a lot of people say, no, they're not coming, but they are. Nissan Leaf EVs will power evacuation centers in Japan when disaster strikes. So in Japan, the Nissan Leaf, which I have, even the old ones, can go two ways, Brian. They can power your home in a power outage. Well, they're getting them together to all go to sort of disaster shelters to power those shelters. And they're setting up the infrastructure to connect to the EVs to do that in advance, which is, you know, Florida, hello. I know we have at least one listener in Florida. Yeah. That's an interesting idea. No, and I think this even happened a little bit, um, you know, when they've had earthquakes and, and tsunamis in Japan. I think this has happened a little bit already, and so now they're kind of formalizing Yeah, the you need to have the infrastructure in place to do it. I mean, you can, uh, you need to set up the, the two-way um, inverter and everything that has to go in the house, which is not cheap and not readily available to hardware stores. So that's cool and a damn good idea. And you know what? I don't know where you're listening in the world, but wherever you are, Think about that, because that's a very good idea. We should be doing that everywhere, including where you and I live. Not that we have any disasters here, thank God, but <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it could happen one day, but there's a lot of other places that are more prone, like Florida and and uh, coastal cities and uh, even eastern Canada that gets hit with blizzards and, and whatnot. Uh, Musk is okay with Tesla going bankrupt if a rival... Uh, built a better EV, but you're not okay, Brian, because your future relies on the Tesla stock. So what are you to say? Well, yes, I am a Tesla shareholder, so I hope they don't go bankrupt. But I guess what I would do is uh, sell my Tesla shares and buy whatever other company that is that's making Who would you bet on right EV? now if you had to place a bet? Yeah, that's a good question. Excluding the um, Chinese companies, which Rivian aren't is... as well known to us. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the Chinese companies definitely. I think Rivian is probably my favorite of the other companies, but it's, it, you know, remains to be seen how healthy they're going to yeah. be financially. I'm impressed with what GM's doing, but we'll see how it comes along. I'm also I'm kind of quietly impressed with Ford because they're getting their products onto the street more so than GM right now. So I think the next year or two yep. will, will tell us a lot. The By the way, the Ford F-150 Lightning has a stop build order and stop ship order. Uh, because a, uh, a truck caught on fire due to a battery issue in the factory after it was inspected and sitting there, or pre-inspection or something like that. So that's not good. Yeah, we mentioned that we already. So, Yeah, I did. Okay. I don't remember that. <laughs> I, I didn't cover it as a made story. Okay. I just threw it in. So you can cut All that. All right. Part. Well, if you're watching on YouTube, I didn't cut that part. And this is the special content that you get on YouTube <laughs> that you don't get at the podcast. So count yourself privileged. Okay. It's a bonus, bonus discussion from Brian and I. That is our show for this week. Brian, that's our time. We're done. You know, once again, big show, huge show. And three years, three years, my friend, three years. We've been doing this, and you people out there have been listening to us. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, as again, I said before, contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. And we've got a YouTube channel who I just spoke to off the podcast because we had a little mix-up. Well, it's there on the YouTube channel for our YouTube friends to, to ponder our sanity over. And thanks to all of our donors who have contributed uh, here and there over the weeks. And if you're new to the show, we'd like you to subscribe to the podcast app because we put out a new show every darn week and you can get them delivered to you. We'll see you next time. See you next week.